Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you very much for joining me here today. Last time we spoke about the unsolved case of Annika Smith and that case was about a young girl who stayed home as she wasn't feeling very well and that was the last time that her family saw her alive again. The disturbing acts that took place in the house are mostly only known to Annika and her murderer. But if you have not seen that, I'll link it up here for you. And I also just wanted to say thank you very much to everyone who has given so much love to my second channel. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to be getting up to a couple of things in the next few weeks. So I hope that you can come along with me. But today we're going to talk about something that I think most of us as South Africans have experienced or we know someone who has experienced this and this is house break-ins. When this happens you feel incredibly dirty like someone has been in your space, touched your things that you have worked so hard for and they've just ransacked your home and gone through your very personal items. But sadly when we do have home invasions those home invaders come with very deadly motives and that is what we're going to delve into today so with that being said let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. In today's case we are heading to Porfada which is a small town in the Northern Cape. And in English, it translates directly to Puff Adder, which is a snake. Allegedly, Porfada was named after the Khoisan leader named Klaas Porfada, but this is just hearsay and not very clear. The surrounds of Porfada are arid and sparse, and most of the business in the small town is either sheep or goat farming. The ground is very harsh, so not much other type of agricultural farming can be done. The town is growing in its economy because of the large amounts of solar power stations that were built there recently. Then, in 1979, a baby named Leon Britz was born. Leon Britz had a brother named Toki, and his parents lived in Porfada for majority of their lives. They owned a hotel here, and this is where they earned their income. Leon was said to be a wonderful person, a shining star. He was very smart at school and did very well academically. He was also head boy of his high school and played lots of sports. When Leon was old enough, he would start working in the hotel that his parents owned and he would start learning how to do the business in the hotel. His brother Toki would not really enjoy the hotel as much as his brother and as soon as he turned 18, he then got married and moved away from the small town and he wanted bigger things. So Leon ultimately stayed in Porfada and and he knew that he was going to take over this hotel business that his parents owned and one day at the hotel there was this massive social gathering people were drinking dancing having fun and then while Leon was working he turned and he noticed this absolutely beautiful young lady she had long flowing brown hair she had beautiful green eyes and he knew instantly that he wanted this young lady but we got to put the brakes on right here because she actually wasn't a young lady she was only 14 years old and Leon was 25 years old at the time and this young lady's name was Sarita Kutsia. Sarita was born on the 6th of September 1990 she was the youngest of three siblings and she had an older brother and sister Sarita and her family managed month to month, but it was very difficult. She felt that she would not really know what to expect each month and things would often change. Be that the money that was coming in from her parents, what they could or couldn't afford, and not only that, but also her parents' relationship and their whole dynamic. That was incredibly turbulent too. But sadly, in 1999, when all three children were very young, Sarita's father sadly passed away. He was bitten by a spider and that spider bite led to a horrendous infection that ultimately took his life. So now Sarita and her family were stuck with one breadwinner and her mom had to support three young children alone. So things were really tough and they struggled a lot and were sadly cast into poverty and they didn't have much at all. So Leon is still setting his eyes on young Sarita and he sees her, he's 25, like I said, she's 14. There's 11 years in this age gap between them. But Leon was determined and once he set his mind to something, he pretty much got things done. And Leon would lavish Sarita in gifts, dining out, going to expensive places, which she has never experienced before. Like I said, she came from a very poor background and she also was very young. And I can imagine that for young Sarita, this was incredibly appreciated. She didn't really know when her next meal was going to come from and she felt like oh she could have this life she could have this luxury life she was incredibly grateful for Leon for giving all of this but also she was incredibly enchanted by all of this because like I said she's never seen this kind of luxury before and Leon said to everybody that he's going to marry Sarita one day so after Leon laid his eyes on Sarita that day they did start to date and they were dating for quite a few years but a year after they started dating 
one of Sarita's school friends, when she was 15 years old, noticed that she started wearing a very baggy uniform. She started to constantly pull her jersey over her stomach and she was very touchy. Like she didn't want anyone to talk to her at this time or hug her or anything like that. And Sarita did go to Leon and she did find out that she was pregnant. And she went to Leon, she told him this, and Leon allegedly was absolutely furious. He said that they cannot find out that she's pregnant because if they do, they would then accuse him of statutory rape, which it was. He was 25 or 26 at this point. She was only 14, allegedly, when they started to sleep together. And I do put full blame on Leon for this because he was the adult. He knew exactly what he was doing and he had the power dynamic in this relationship. So for young Sarita, she was absolutely terrified. Leon was raging at her. He didn't want anyone to know about this. So he then told Sarita to take some money, go to a town that is not anywhere near Pofada because no one can know about this. She had to then go there by herself, probably walk or catch a taxi or something because she was too young to drive. So she had to go there alone, go to the doctor and confirm that she was pregnant, come all the way back to tell Leon that actually she was pregnant with twins and not only that but Leon said you need to get rid of it and go back to that doctor and do so which she did. Now Sarita had an incredibly traumatic time at the doctors she was very young she had to go through this all alone and then come straight back home and because Sarita and Leon had this whole facade of a very romantic relationship Leon apparently pressurized her to get up straight after she had this procedure. He kind of let her lie in bed apparently for a day or so. And then he told her like, you need to keep face. You can't just lie in bed and mope around. You need to get up and get out and we need to be the couple that we are. Allegedly it would come out later that Sarita had PTSD from this. She was in an incredible amount of pain from this procedure. She also didn't have much recovery time and she had to pretend to be something that she wasn't at that time. So like I said earlier, this relationship was already starting on this massive power dynamic between Leon and Sarita. Leon had the money, Leon had the work experience, Leon had life experience, and he was older, much bigger than Sarita. So he had a lot more in his favor. Then in 2008, around the end of the year, kind of close to matric time where they were going to write their finals, Sarita fell pregnant again, and she went to tell Leon again, and he allegedly said that she needs to get rid of it again. And she put her foot down and she said she's not going back to that clinic again, it's not happening, and she's going to keep this baby. So then, by the time that she finished school in early 2009, Sarita and Leon then got married. It was alleged in some of the articles that Leon spoke to his brother Toki just before he got married and he said that he doesn't know if this is the life that he envisioned. He said that he had a very clear direction of what he wanted in life and having children so young with Sarita, getting married so quickly, it wasn't exactly what he envisioned and he wasn't sure if Sarita was the wife that he envisioned. And he also didn't want to be tied to Sarita's family issues or her family dynamic legally. He knew that she had a troubled background and he didn't exactly want to be part of that. But their first baby was born shortly after they got married and, and she was a girl. Then, just two years after they had their first baby, around 2011, Sarita and Leon had twin boys. Then, by the birth of their twins, sadly Leon's father passed away and his mom was aging, so Toki and Leon decided to put their mother in, inside a retirement home and Leon then took over fully running the hotel. But Leon didn't only just run the hotel, he ran other businesses as well. He apparently owned a bottle store. He also owned a catering company that would help give food to the miners that were in the area. And he also owned two rental properties that he would have to manage as well. Sarita also wanted to start her own business and she did do so. Leon helped her start up her own business and what Sarita would do is she would get equipment for the miners that were going into the mine. So Leon would handle the catering side of it and then Sarita would handle the equipment part or whatever they needed inside the mines and Leon said that he would help her start this but ultimately it's her baby it's her business and she needs to manage it because he has way too many things on his plate but she did also help Leon with his businesses as well. So to give some context if you are not from South Africa where we have a lot of rural areas or areas in South Africa that are very sparse from big cities or major towns 
And if you have children in these very rural or very small towns, sometimes the best school or a school even is hundreds of kilometers away. And sometimes the children would have to walk or they would have to get transport to get to these schools. And it would take hours for them to get there every day. So because Leon and Sarita had a bit more money, their children wouldn't be schooled in Porfada. They would be schooled a couple hundred kilometers away in another town. And what Sarita and Leon decided to do was that Sarita would take the children during the week and they would go and stay in another house that they owned a couple hundred kilometers away. They would then go to that school and they would stay in their house in that area during the week. And then Sarita and the children would come back to Puff Adder to be with Leon on the weekends. And at first this was working quite well, but as the years went by and the children were getting older, this really had an effect on Leon and Sarita and their relationship started to become very distant because for five days out of the seven, they were not near each other. But sadly, in 2017, Sarita's health took a very horrible turn and she was diagnosed with cancer of the womb and she had to have a full hysterectomy. And not only that, she also had very bad heart condition and she had rheumatoid arthritis as well. So Sarita not only would stay with the children in the week, hundreds of kilometers away from Leon, but also a couple times a month, she would have to go to Johannesburg to have treatment with the specialized doctors. So Leon, of course, was trying to be supportive of his wife and trying to be there. He had businesses to run, he had children to look after, he had children to get to school. Sarita was in Joburg. It was incredibly stressful for this couple. Sarita was said to be absolutely stunning with vibrant green eyes and long dark hair. And she would often turn heads and Leon often hated this. He allegedly would tell her how he expected her to dress and that she can't wear anything too revealing. She cannot have tattoos, she cannot smoke and she cannot ride motorbikes. So because Leon and Sarita had many businesses, they obviously had a lot of money coming in and Leon would try and invest, be that in Krugerrands or in diamonds. And he would often have these Krugerrands inside safes in many of his businesses or in his home, as well as diamonds and cash. So he wouldn't only put everything in the bank, he would also store things in his home and so on. So because Leon had so many businesses, he would often get into tiffs like most businesses with suppliers or vendors that either they weren't being paid quick enough or they were having a little bit of a scrap about what was expected to be done. And Leon said that he was getting death threats around 2017 by the vendors, by the suppliers or people that he didn't know. And he would tell Sarita this and they would often talk about it and they felt unsafe, but they also just kind of brushed it off as well because it became such commonplace that he was being threatened all the time that his money and his family were in danger. There were also allegations from both ends that in 2018 affairs were happening. Apparently, Sarita went through Leon's phone and she noticed that there were incriminating pictures of other women on his phone, allegedly. They apparently talked about this and they kind of just moved on from it. And it was never really proven if Leon did have an affair. However, Sarita definitely did have an affair and she had an affair at least with two men. One was apparently more of a fling, but one was quite a serious affair. And because he doesn't have any further input in the rest of the story, I'm just going to call him her lover. So with Sarita and her lover, he stayed more in the Johannesburg areas. And because Sarita was closer to Porfada in the Northern Cape, they did have a long distance relationship. So they would text all day and they would call each other at least four times a day. So they were talking very often. And because Sarita was living hundreds of kilometers away from Paul Fader at the time and her husband Leon, it was easy to communicate with her lover. And also when she would go and have her treatments in Johannes for her illnesses, she would then go and meet up with her lover. And it seemed like people in her family knew that she was having an affair because her mom and sister would come with her to Johannesburg for these treatments. And they would often all go and stay with her lover in Johannesburg. So they clearly knew that she was with this lover. But no one spoke about it and no one told Leon about it because as far as I could read, I don't think he knew that she had a lover. But allegedly divorce was brought up. Sarita asked Leon for a divorce. She said that they weren't happy. And allegedly Leon said that that is absolutely not happening and that there are only two ways that they would ever separate. And Leon said that the first way that they would separate is if he murdered her and then he killed himself as well. So that was option one for her. Option two was that Leon would leave her, but then he would take everything from her. He would take their children from her. He would take the money from her. So she would be left 
absolutely destitute. I assume from Sarita's memories as a child, she definitely didn't want to be in poverty again and be left with absolutely no money. And obviously she's lived most of her life now quite in a lavish lifestyle and she didn't want to lose that. So now that that had all been said and done, Sarita felt incredibly trapped. She felt that she had nowhere to go. She couldn't speak to Leon about separating. She couldn't speak to anyone else about it because they would just go back to Leon and tell him exactly what she said. And like I said, she felt trapped and she even asked her lover who lived in near Johannesburg to ask him if he would kill Leon because she felt that she had no other way to get away from Leon. And at first her lover thought, uh, very funny, like I know you want to get away from your husband, but very funny. And then she kept asking and she kept asking and he was like, no, I'm not going to kill your husband. Like this is very, very bad. And he really tried to persuade her like, this is not okay. You have other means. You should not be doing this. And then eventually she kind of just stopped texting him about it and said, oh no, don't worry. I've found one of my brother's school friends to handle it and then they just stopped talking about it. So we clearly just hopping straight into what happened because Sarita felt like she had her back up against the wall. She wanted to leave. We're not sure if she probably wanted to be with her lover or to actually just get away from Leon or an accumulation of both. But Sarita's brother's friend's name, who they went to school with, was Jacques von Furen. And Jacques von Furen was around 35 years old at the time. And Jacques was going through a really, really tough time. He had just been divorced from his wife and his wife had taken their children far away from him. And not only that, he had also injured himself at work. So the work then put him on lesser times, earning less money. So he was incredibly stressed because he had payments that he had to make his wife for the children. He was earning less money. So so he then turned sadly to alcohol and drugs and this was his vice as well. It was also said that the alcohol was also another reason that his wife divorced him. But one night Sarita and Jacques happened to be at a braai in the same area or barbecue. They happened to be in the same area at the same time and this is when Sarita saw him. She started talking to him and then she took down his number. Kid you not, a couple days later after this whole braai happened, she then started texting Jacques saying, oh Leon is very abusive to me both physically emotionally sexually and she just wants to get away from him and this really triggered Jacques because allegedly Jacques had a very abusive upbringing his father was incredibly physical with his mother a lot of the time and Jacques was very young so he felt that he could never stand up to his father and then by the time that Jacques was old enough sadly his father passed away so he never got that peace to be able to confront his father about what he did to his mother so Jacques was very triggered by anyone who ever felt abused in their relationship and this was a really sore point from him so when Sarita started speaking about this with what happened with Leon, he felt that he needed to protect Sarita. He felt that he, they've known each other for a very long time. They were more like brother and sister because he was very close friends with Sarita's brother and they went to school together. So there was a long history here and Sarita may have played on this a little bit. And Jacques kind of felt that he could agree he would be able to do this for her and he would be able to protect her. And they started speaking more and they agreed that Sarita would give him 400,000 Rand. But as they were talking more, Jacques said that he wouldn't be able to do this himself. He does not feel comfortable actually murdering Leon, but he could help to bring other people in to do so. And him and Sarita then agreed and then the pandemic kit and everything went quiet for a few months. However, it only went quiet in terms of Jacques and Sarita communicating about Leon's murder because things were happening in the background as well that was edging Sarita to become desperate. And what was happening is that obviously because the pandemic hit businesses were really struggling the mines had shut down if it wasn't necessary of what they were mining for leon's bottle store had shut down and the rental property the people who were inside the rental property they weren't working they couldn't pay so things were really heating up for the brits home and they became very very tense with each other they were fighting a whole lot more and now they had to be in the same house as well so now they were even more on edge with each other and not only that but during the past one of Leon's staff who either worked in the bottle store or at the hotel she actually came to live with the Brits family because she came there to help with the children she came to help Sarita to be able to run her business on the side as well so she was living in the home as well and she would do a lot for Sarita she absolutely idolized her and Sarita played this to her advantage a little bit as well but then a couple months after the pandemic first hit or lockdown first hit Sarita felt like she was absolutely going to lose her mind and she wanted to get this 
ball rolling again with, with Jacques. So what she did was she texted Jacques and she said, okay, are we going to get this sorted? And Jacques said, okay, I want half of the money up front now. So at least 200,000 Rand up front. So Sarita had to do this in roughly two payments. She then went to withdraw 70,000 Rand and the two met up at a car park that was quite far out of Porfada. They then spoke about it more and Jacques said that he knew someone who he would be able to recruit to be able to do the murder. And so the two then separated and Jacques said he wanted the other 130,000 Rand. So Sarita then gets this young lady who was living with them to deliver a care package of some sort to Jacques. The young lady did not know that there was 130,000 Rand inside this care package because it was kind of like packed with chocolate, sweets, fruit, a whole lot of nuts, that kind of thing. And she then delivered it to Jacques, unknowingly being a part of this murder. So like I said, Jacques would then recruit someone else and he recruited his friend that he had been friends for a long time with named Enrich Williams. The two went to university together, they also worked together, and Enrich also dabbled in illegal abalone poaching. So Jacques felt comfortable that he was the best criminal friend that he could recruit, and that's what he did. And at first Enrich was like, no, I'm not going to murder someone. But then Jacques told him about the massive payout, and he said, okay, he'll do it. Enrich was 34 at the time and he felt that he wasn't going to be able to overpower Leon by himself and he then recruited another person named Amantle. Amantle was only 24 years old at the time and he had just finished university with an engineering degree. He wanted to go and study further but he didn't have the funds and he thought that this was a quick payout to be able to do that. So Jacques then texted Sarita and he said okay he's got his men and the plan can get running. So Sarita said, okay, she will then video the house and the layout of the house. She also pointed in the video of this massive couch that they could hide behind to surprise Leon and attack him from behind. So she had it all planned. She knew exactly where they had to be, which sliding door they had to open, which would not be locked. And also what times Leon would be out of the house so that they could go into the house. And she also said that Leon often kept the diamonds and Krugerrands and money inside the safe upstairs. She said that they could take whatever they want, anything they wanted, but they must make it look like a robbery homicide. And one point was that she would not allow Jacques to be at the murder scene at all because some people may know Jacques because of her brother as well. So she said that Jacques shouldn't be there, but he must orchestrate it and Enrich and Amantle need to do the whole dirty work for them. Sarita also did mention that they had two big dogs and she said that you must not hurt the dogs, but they will attack you obviously if they see you jump a wall or if they see you coming into the house and they are very protective over Leon. So if they see you harming Leon, of course they're going to attack you. But she said that these dogs, because they were so big, they had one weakness and that weakness was Bourreau sausages or those big thick sausages. So she said, make sure you buy a whole pack of these and scatter them around the house, around the garden. And in October of 2020, they decided to make sure that things were going to happen. But on the 6th of October, they were supposed to go inside the home and get this all done. But Toki, Leon's brother, happened to stop over and they spoke, they had a braai, they then slept over and they drank the night before and then Toki left really early in the morning because he had to get back to work and he wanted to get some tires or to get a new license plate for his wife's vehicle. So he left really early on the 7th of October 2020. But Toki was seen last at Leon's house and keep that in mind for later. So then on the 7th of October 2020, the men then gathered their weapons, gathered lighter fluid to burn the clothes and some gloves. They then all pulled into a petrol station and waited for Sarita's go ahead. Driving the car in the petrol station was Jacques and he went against Sarita's request of not being in the area during the murder. Then around 6am she told them that they could enter the home as Leon had now left for work. He would be at the hotel and they can now go into the home and wait for him behind the couch. At around 10 a.m. Sarita called Leon to say that apparently their dogs have gotten out of the yard and he needs to return home now. Apparently the dogs getting out of the yard was a common occurrence and Leon knew exactly that the neighbors would not be impressed so he headed home right away. Enrich and Amantle were inside the home and they crept in leaving the sausages lying around for the dogs as they had been told to do so. They stayed behind the couch in wait. Then they heard Leon's bucky pull up to the front of the house and they heard footsteps coming towards the sliding door. And as soon as he walked past them, past this big brown couch, 
Enrich and Amantle jumped up and attacked him from behind. But Leon was a big man. He was fit, active, strong, and he fought back. He was almost two meters tall and weighed quite a lot, probably more than both of the men put together. So the struggle then ensued and headed outside. Enrich used all of his strength and hit Leon behind the back of the head with a baseball bat. Leon then fell to the ground mumbling. And once Leon was on the ground, they both pounced. They stabbed him at least eight times with their knives and they took what looked like a dog collar or a dog chain and strangled Leon to death. They then took his wallet out of his pants and pushed him into the pool face down. The men then raided the safe and took the Kruger rands and diamonds as they had been instructed to do so. A month later, then called Jacques to fetch them and they then headed into his Volkswagen Polo and drove away. Sarita then got the call from Jacques to say that it had been done. Once she knew that it had been done, she was still a couple of hundred kilometers away, remember staying in the home where her children were going to school. But she knew that Leon had requested paint a couple of weeks ago. So she then loaded up her bucky with a whole lot of paint and then headed to their home in Porfada. Then by 11.30, Sarita called the hotel screaming into the phone and panicking. She said that someone had murdered Leon. Sarita would also call the police and Leon's brother, Toki. Leon's brother and the hotel manager were the first people on the scene. The police then second and they all had a look through the house and everyone said that the house was very orderly for a house break in. The only place that was ransacked was the safe, but nothing else had been taken. And this was a massive crime in a small town and the rumor mill started churning and social media was alive with theories on who the murderer was. So far murders are a very heated topic in South Africa and this is exactly what social media was speaking about who could be the culprits for this murder and people were accusing and going to the hotel and assuming people in the hotel had murdered Leon and there was really a mob justice going around picking up people in the town of who could have murdered Leon. And eventually the poor fighter police said that if one more person goes to anybody else accusing them of murder, they will all be arrested. So this social media mob justice kind of slowed down and people started to just whisper on the streets rather than going onto their social media platforms to accuse people who were not even there. But remember I said that Toki was one of the last people to see Leon alive according to neighbors and witnesses who had seen Leon's brother there the night before the murder and he then left really early. So Toki was 100% honed in on as the main culprit for this murder. They accused him of stealing from Leon, wanting to change the will for Leon from his mother, who was really suffering from dementia at the time. And Toki and Leon knew that she was really suffering, she was really bad. And they had spoken about the will and they had spoken about what was going to happen after she passed, which I know is a horrible thing to talk about, but as adults, they needed to have this conversation. And people had overheard or assumed that that was the reason that Toki had murdered his brother. And the whole town and everybody really thought that Leon's brother had murdered him. And so Toki would go to Sarita because Sarita was obviously crying. She was very sad and they would go and comfort each other. And Sarita would comfort Toki. She would say, oh, don't worry about it. I'll get you a lawyer. They don't need to talk about you like that. Like this is horrible. And she was really supportive of Toki who was really, really in a dark place at the time. But what would come out later was that Sarita was actually feeding the police this information about Leon's brother Toki. That, that was the reason that Toki murdered Leon because they were fighting about the will, because he was the last person there. And so she was feeding the police this information while Toki was coming to her and crying about his brother's murder. So in small towns, generally we have people who are the best at certain things. Betty may be the best at baking and Carlos may have the best car shop. But in Porfada, Rion was your cameraman. He was the CCTV guy. So when this all happened, Rion knew that there was CCTV footage that was in the area at the time. So a couple days after Leon's funeral, he was straight at it inside the TV footage. He knew exactly where the cameras were in the area and he really found a lot of information. And what he would do is he would sit through hours of CCTV footage in the area near Leon's house because there were cameras actually pointing to Leon's front door. So they then saw a Volkswagen Polo park outside of Leon's house. Two men then got out of the vehicle and entered Leon's home. So Rion had this footage and he was telling people about it. So Rita then heard that apparently there was CCTV footage. So she went to watch and as she's watching the CCTV footage, apparently she then dropped and she started crying. And Rion thought, oh, like this is so sad. She's crying because 
she now sees these killers entering the home and she sees the people who are going to murder her husband. But no, she wasn't crying because of that. She was so upset and angry that Jacques didn't listen to her about his Volkswagen Polo being in the area at the time. She then went straight home and started texting Jacques saying, you're an idiot, I told you that you shouldn't have had your polo there. Now they have your polo. Luckily, the camera CCTV footage isn't very good, so they can't get your number plate, but you need to lay low and not drive that vehicle. By the way, I completely forgot to mention this. Sarita and Jacques were communicating via a burner phone, not their actual phones. But now as Toki and Sarita are spending a lot more time together, starts to notice a lot more things about Sarita, like straight after the funeral, Toki he's still coming to Sarita to come to try and get some type of comfort however he notices things that really start to make his skin crawl like one she got a tattoo which she knew that Leon hated she then started driving motorcycles which she knew that he hated she had lavish parties a lot of parties after his murder and they were often at the house lots of people were coming through and apparently she was wearing outfits that were very revealing Toki knew that Leon really wouldn't like now because Sarita and Leon's estates or money or finances were frozen because there was a murder investigation happening Sarita couldn't get the rest of the 200,000 rand to pay Jacques, Enrich and Amantle. So she started getting threats from Enrich because he wanted his money and Enrich was also threatening Jacques. So there was a whole lot of pressure now from Amantle and Enrich that they wanted their money. They did the deed that they were expected to do and now they wanted their pay. And so Sarita was getting pressure. Apparently these threats that she was getting, she did take to the police and she showed her friends but she left out the I owe them 200,000 Rand kind of part, but she showed them the threatening text messages and horrible phone calls that she kept getting. And people started to feel really bad for her. She also said that the people who murdered her husband are now out for her. So people felt so bad for Sarita. Sarita then also hired a bodyguard. She first had two, she fired the one, then the second one that she kept. She became very friendly with him and people would often see them out together with the children. He would often discipline the children or shout at them or correct their behavior. And so people assumed that they were now together because he was also living in Sarita and Leon's home. Like I said, Jacques von Furen was also being threatened by Enrich and he couldn't do anything. He was asking Sarita, Sarita was saying no. So he was getting a lot of pressure and actually he was not dealing with it very well. He then decided to go and see his sister in series because he had just had enough and he just needed to get away and he felt like he was crumbling because he couldn't handle this pressure. So instead of using his Volkswagen Polo, which was already on CCTV footage, he then decided to take his motorcycle. So he went to Ceres to be with his sister for a couple of days and eventually he just felt absolutely horrible and he confessed everything to his sister. His sister then told his mom and the two women then sat Jacques down and said, you need to tell police, you need to go to police and you need to tell them everything of what you've done. And Jacques agreed. He was like, I feel incredibly bad. I need to go to police. So Jacques did actually damage his bike while he was coming up to his sister. So his sister then said that they're going to take him to the bus station where he could then go to the police station and go to Porfada. So he did that. His sister and Jacques were then at the bus station and while they were waiting for the bus to be called or for them to be able to board the bus, the police detectives who were on this case were already two steps ahead of Jacques and they realized that something is fishy. Someone had also tipped them on this Volkswagen Polo that had belonged to Jacques and that he was up at series with his sister. So police headed straight there and they arrested Jacques and he was then taken back to Pouf Adder. So police didn't really know much about the case. They knew that Jacques had this Volkswagen Polo and they could pinpoint him outside of the home. So they just sat Jacques down and they were like, so who did you drop off? Like, can you give us more details? And Jacques just blurted everything out. He was not holding it in anymore. Jacques said that he would tell them everything if he could get a plea deal which the police agreed to. So Jacques then was told to testify against whoever he dropped off and whoever the mastermind is for this case. So Jacques said, I will tell you everything, like I said, as long as I get a plea deal. So they agreed and they said that if he testifies and they do get an arrest for the rest of the people, then he will only get 20 years in prison with five years suspended sentence. He would also get parole a lot earlier. So if he behaves well, if he's a good person in prison. So Jacques then told police that it was Enrich and Amantle and Sarita was the mastermind of this whole thing. Police had their suspicions. They thought that it was Sarita, but they couldn't really prove it. 
and this just really honed in on her. Sarita then took up an attorney and hired full-time carer for her children. And what would also come out was that Sarita was absolutely desperate to keep the hotel because just before Leon's death, he was actually going to sell the hotel to someone for 50% less because all Leon wanted, he was so desperate to just get away from all of the businesses, to just get away from everything, all the stress, take his children away from the school, to be able to be closer together in a school that was closer and that they could just live on a farm together and have the quiet, slow life. That's all he wanted was to just be with his family. And that's why he was so desperate to sell the hotel. So Rita, I assume, knew about this. And that may be another motive for why she wanted Leon out of the picture. Enrich was arrested in a sting operation a day after Jacques was arrested, but pleaded not guilty. Amantle was arrested a couple weeks later. Then, on the 19th of March, 2021, five police cars arrived at the home of Sarita and arrested her. Sarita pleaded guilty to murder and robbery with aggravating circumstances and received 25 years for the murder of her husband and 10 years for robbery. And because she pleaded guilty, she will be eligible for parole at any time. She did say, however, that she was abused for many years by Leon. She brought up the alleged pregnancy terminations and she said that she honestly believed that this was the only way out for her and she had no other choice. With regards to Enrich and Amantle, they would also be found guilty and would receive life sentences. Before we finish this case, I was busy googling and I was deep diving and I came upon a picture and I was like, wait, I know that face. And if you are an OG on this channel or you have been watching for quite a while, we have talked about many cases. But one of the cases that we spoke about was the Griquistat murders. And remember, the Griquistat murders was with Don Steenkamp, where he murdered his sister because allegedly there was some, he was trying to sleep with his sister and then his father may have caught him. So that was the Griquistat murders. And if you haven't seen that, I will link it up here for you. But prison that Sarita is in, it has a female section and a male section, and it's divided by a fence or wall where the men and women can communicate. So allegedly, Don Steenkamp is in this prison with Sarita, and the police officer that arrested Sarita and Don is the same officer that was in both cases. So very hectic. And apparently they communicate and they speak about things of how to allegedly get illegal things into prison. Like Sarita wants a laptop because no one will pay for a laptop for her. She wants a laptop and she wants some other contraband apparently to be able to study further in prison. But there's more. I also stumbled upon another picture, which was this one. And if you know this lady here, you know that that is Cecilia from Devil's Dorp. And she was part of that whole Satan cult where they did a whole lot of murders. If you also haven't seen that, I'll link it up here. But allegedly, Sarita and Cecilia are lovers in prison. I had to tell you, I was just shocked. I was like, how is this whole world coming full circle? So that is my little tidbit of information for you on a Sunday. Let me know what you think of this case down below. And if what she is saying is true, her early relationship is absolutely horrendous and the power dynamic is disgusting with Leon and Sarita. But if she is not telling the truth, she is either one great liar and she almost got away with it. But let me know what you think of this case down below. I hope that you have a great weekend further. Please stay safe out there and I'll see you again next time. Bye.